Why? Why live? When do you know if a friendship is over? I have um, traded my voice for legs. For those of you who think I'm a confident person, I thought I was too until I tried to vlog in public. Did you need a permission slip? Here it is. Hello, I'm a familiar face, but I'm guessing this behind me isn't. So inspired. That pigeon nearly took my head off. I wanted to do a Q&A this week, but I didn't want to make it about me. I wanted to make it about you. Um, and because I feel like there's a lot of people who watch this channel whose brains work similar to me, um, I opened an existential Q&A. I was like, ask me your really hard questions. Ask me your agony aunt, like soul questions. And we're gonna get into some deep talks. And I thought, what better place for deep talks than outdoors? And also, if this pandemic carries on, the bitch is gonna to have to get used to vlogging outdoors. And I find it very excruciating, extremely embarrassing, but I'm gonna to need to get used to it because I don't know about you, but I'm very sick of sitting, editing hours of videos of my white walls in my tiny flat, so. Here we are at Kenwood House uh, in Hampstead Heath. We're going to have a walk around Hampstead Heath and answer some of your questions. So the first question actually kind of inspired this location hop today. Why do people love London so much? I don't get it. For me, the opportunities and experiences just do not make up for the cost and stress of living in London. So I thought I'd take you to one of my favourite places in London. Not saying that places like this don't exist elsewhere, but I think that people have this really big smoke, foggy, um, always crammed in, always busy like idea of London. And yeah, even this park is quite busy for a park <laughs> today, but it's still this big expanse of open air and land and huge ancient forests that's right in the middle of London um, that I've been coming to all the time I've lived here, which has been like nearly eight years. And I just wanted to show you around because I think it's really cool, the history and the ancient woods and stuff. It doesn't make me feel as disconnected um, from nature or from history as maybe living in a big modern city might make it seem like it would. I understand why people don't like London. In fact, I wish less people liked London so the prices would go down. And I think it really depends on where you grew up for me i grew up in a town it was a really it's the 10th biggest city in the uk coventry it just didn't like i never felt at home in my hometown and if you've never felt that i understand why somewhere like london wouldn't be a pull for you and i also think like being a midlands kid like there's there's a really big thing about northern pride right and there's a thing about scottish pride it's, loads of people are proud to be welsh proud to be um, from Cornwall. I've never met anybody proud to be from Norfolk, but if you're out there, do let me know because Norfolk is nice. You should be proud. But the Midlands is kind of a place that nobody really claims. The Northerners are like, oh, fuck off, you sound Southern. And then um, the Southern, like genuinely when I moved to London, people kept calling me the Northerner because of my accent, which has now, as you can tell, changed. <laughs> Coventry, I think has got better now. I just always like, if I ever wore a colour on the bus, like everybody would stare at me and be like, who the fuck does she think she is? I remember like really wanting to stay in my hometown. Basically, I guess, like partly because I was with somebody who um, was really proud to be from Coventry and really wanted to stay so I kind of like wanted to take that on and I remember like going on my gap year and like getting mentally ready to stay in Coventry forever. I found this coffee shop um, and I like asked to talk to the manager and I like begged him to let me run a poetry and music night in his um, coffee shop because there weren't any poetry. It's the 10th biggest city in the UK, right? And there were no poetry events or really any open mics that weren't like in really dangerous bars that a few of my friends had got sexually assaulted in. So I was like, well, I don't really go there. So I started this night and I put it on and, you know, obviously I have some really lovely um, supportive friends who came for the first couple, but after a couple of months, it was clear that nobody really wanted it. Nobody else craved just a poetry music night in Coventry. Nobody was coming. I was like putting out leaflets anywhere and nobody wanted to come. It was like one of those moments where I was like, cool. I don't judge the city of Coventry for what it has or what it doesn't have or what it wants, but I realized that me and Coventry wanted completely different things and I was never going to fit in there. And for me, London has been a place that I've really felt at home, mainly because it's not anything. And I think the kind of cool thing about London is if you don't vibe with wherever you live, come to London because nobody vibes in London and also everybody vibes here because there's just so many vibes and it's not one thing. 
you can get on a bus and sit there for 10 minutes and be in a completely different city, a completely different community, a pretty, completely different atmosphere. That is really exciting when you're trying to find yourself in your 20s and you're trying to work out where you fit in. Uh, to be able to only live in one flat, but really effectively live in about 15 cities um, is really cool. Admittedly, it is expensive, but often I think some, some things are expensive because everybody wants to, to do it because there's a reason everybody wants to be here. I think a lot of people don't or people resent it but like I feel like I knew the trade-off I was doing by moving to London I knew that I would watch my friends from the Midlands uh, buy houses and have families without me and because I'm not from London and I don't have any family that live in London and I can't stay in London uh, the rent meant that from a financial perspective I would stagnate a little but because of the things I'm interested in and because of the things I'm curious about I feel like I haven't I've done the opposite of stagnate in every other area of my life from living in London. And I'm not saying you can't do that anywhere else. You know, there is that Dick Whittington aspect to it where it's like, I'm going to London to seek my fortune. <laughs> the most ironic statement ever said. Dear reader, Dick Whittington had not looked at Zoopla. But especially because I wanted to work in the book industry, it's where about 90% of the industry is still. And I'd like that to be different, uh, but it's not right now. So it's more like you have to lower the expectations of the rest of your life. So like... Um, the kind of clothes you buy the kind of food you eat everything is probably less than a lot of my friends who lived in other cities but like that's fine that's what I've chosen I have um traded my voice for legs or something I bloody love London and um, especially I guess because I grew up like learning about the history of it so having all that history on top of each other and I always go on walking tours and go to museums and stuff and if that's not something that excites you I can imagine why London isn't that interesting and because I really love theatre as well I've been, been able to go to loads of like offbeat weird theatre like I used to save up and get the train here and go to like the shows that I knew I was gonna like and I knew like I knew I was gonna have a good time but um living in London means you can take a chance on like weird as shit and that's been really cool as well um let's get going and i'm going to show you around Hampstead heath and hopefully you see why i love this part of london at least okay so this question says am i the only career driven feisty female who has hit a bit of a roadblock and now feels a bit conflicted about covid do i want to hustle and reach new heights or actually am i perfectly fine doing my own thing getting a decent wage and seeing my friends family and going to the gym etc because balance so my initial reaction is to think that it is more likely if you are female identifying that you'll have a knee-jerk reaction to alter your personal goals and personal fulfillment and kind of offer up your own um, fulfillment at the altar of others. So like my initial reaction is to ward against that but then I also think that there is um, a really short-sighted capitalist mindset to hustling pushing yourself up career ladders that are so precarious and and so dissolvable i definitely have more questions about this question <laughs> which is always good a question should always be met with another question there's no definites in this world so i guess i would have to ask it depends on the hustle it depends on whether the hustle is something where you want to build yourself within an industry that you if you're really honest with yourself long term doesn't benefit people or if the hustle is you getting better at a skill um, or a thing or building a thing that brings you joy and helps you cultivate good things like it helps build stuff for other people is your hustle a hustle of abundance or is it something that you will only hustle individually up a ladder and only gain stuff for yourself because if the hustle is trying to get richer statistically that probably won't make you happier and yeah spending more time with your friends and family and looking after your body and focusing on small gratitudes is um don't tell the millionaires uh much more time efficient which is what they like which is why it's weird that they want to get so rich anyway i i think that covid is really and this doesn't make it mean anything. That doesn't transcend it into a important event that couldn't have not happened or something that isn't sad. But I ha I do think that a byproduct of the shit thing that is COVID has helped people rearrange in their head what they think is important. I don't think that should result in people sidelining their own passions creatively or intellectually long term, just because in the short term you have to focus on survival. But I do think that you can't sacrifice intellectually transcending There's, again i think the problem is like with a hustle do you mean like a career hustle where you do intrinsically get better at something and that therefore it's kind of a skill pursuit or an intellectual pursuit or a creative pursuit or if it's something where you are just becoming more senior to other people <laughs> um and not getting to hone your own skills because and this is not what you asked this is a complete side note of mine aside from all of the like systemic 
ecological psychological damage that big business does it also just makes all jobs less fulfilling Um, and one of the things about big companies that I find really frustrating is that the people that benefit the most from them are the people who aren't actually doing any of the work they're just managing the work (laughs) and that can sometimes be a thing of the imagination um the over management of a skill takes away how satisfying a skill-based job is if you're not allowed to manage your own workload and strategize about how effectively you can do your job Uh, and if that's outsourced to somebody above you that can make the job way less fulfilling and interesting and stimulating and it also means that if you're good at something but you want to get paid more for it a hustle if you will often doing that within a company is kind of impossible because to be paid more you can't just get better at your job you have to stop doing your job and manage other people doing their job if that makes sense which it doesn't make any sense but if what i'm saying meant sense rather than being followed through on because that doesn't make any goddamn sense so in summary yeah you should totally spend more time with your family and friends um and look after smaller things in your life as well and I think that it can be a call to arms for uh, a more balanced life but I don't necessarily think that means that you should stop pushing yourself or like enjoying something that is privately yours you might want to redirect it if you think that maybe you're using your skill in a way that doesn't align with your values but that doesn't mean that you stop jiving to your own salsa (laughs) wiggling to your own beat this question made me think a lot thank you so much Okay, let's go somewhere else. Good job I'm wearing Lady Danger. Okay, so this question is asking, when do you know if a friendship is over? This is sad, but it's happened to me quite a few times and I don't think it should make you feel... Excuse me for the dogs. I've seen so many dogs today. This is dog central, dog central. Reassessing all my career moves and wondering if I should have just become a dog walker. So this question has often plummeted me into a sense of despair and like, what the fuck? Um, But it's always brought me back to the question of like, what do you think friendship is for? I've said before on the channel that I think there should be probably be more words for friendship, just like there are different words for different stages of relationships. There is definitely a big circle of people that I truly respect. And if they ever really needed my help, Um, in a big way I would probably like go out of my way to help them because I respect them and the respect is mutual and I think what they're doing with their life is cool and I want to help them survive and better themselves not only because I care about them as a person but also because who they are slots in with the way I'd like the world to be which I don't think is a selfish reason but I think sometimes you know that somebody who you're not that close to or you can't be that close to is still um, pushing the world in the same direction as you and that makes you want to help them so I have a huge like wheel of people like that but they're not people that I would put up with um repetitively using me without thanking me only getting in touch when they wanted something or disrespecting me in like another way if you're being treated badly by somebody I think it's okay to be like you're on my outer circle of people that I still care about and I want to do well but I'm not gonna like prioritize I don't think you have to do like a dramatic breakup or anything and I think that while open communication is really good there doesn't need to be like a really dramatic element of it you can just like because another another thing for me is um, I find it really hard to compute having too many long distance friendships Um, there's people that I visit in different kind of parts of the world and different parts of the country that whenever I'm there I'm like let's meet up or I'll stay with them or when they're in London they'll come and stay with me and we have these really deep talks but in between we don't really talk and that's totally fine in fact that really works for me Um, there are a few people that I do keep in regular contact with that are Uh, long distance but as somebody who's all of my family is also long distance it's just like a lot of time to put aside when you don't get any face-to-face time with people I think it can be quite lonely to have the majority of your long-term friendships long distance because you can't give somebody the same kind of friendship that you could do if they were physically there you know it's just you have to accept that it's different so if it's because of distance or because you don't feel like they're treating you very well you don't need to do a big friendship breakup with them you can just be like hey I care about you but I'm not going to be able to be in constant contact or I'm not going to be available for these kind of requests and be clear like how much time you can put aside to support them but friendships often have like resurgences as well and I think it's been really interesting realizing there are people who I haven't talked to in ages that I really missed during the pandemic like I really missed them um, or I really worried about them and hope they were okay I had a really great like maybe like hour or two conversation with a friend from uni 
who used to be one of my best friends and we don't really talk anymore because we're both just really busy but when there was a pandemic on and everything felt like the world was crumbling I was like I want to talk to John (laughs) and we had like a really great really long conversation and I really value friendships like that that are just like you're never not connected to that person uh, but you're also not like in each other's pockets but I knew that if I lived near him then we pop round to each all the time and have tea and this is a really long answer <laughs> I mean what were you expecting what did you what did you even come here for quick snappy sound bites you were always in the wrong place I think when you both expect different things from the friendship or you both have different capacities to offer stuff to the friendship I think that's when a friendship is kind of over not completely over but it's obviously not going to work in the same way the relationship isn't going to work so I think you can't be blamed for a friendship not working in the same way that you can't be blamed for a relationship not working because this this weird intangible thing where sometimes people just click and sometimes they just stop clicking and we don't know why and I think it's also because if you've got a good friend a good friendship you're helping each other grow and you're not taking control of the direction in which you're growing which is what being a good friend is but sometimes that means that person grows a different way to you or in a different direction or has a different emphasis we need a new word for this like wheel of people that you care about and that you're connected with and that you that you like and then an inner circle of people that you can really depend on and look after you and are like your family and they're two different things and sometimes people are not in a position to be in one or the other i think a monkey just fell from this tree i'm gonna go oh my god it's so far down (laughs) so this person asks Uh, She was talking about bagging on your younger selves, which is something I've talked about in other videos. On a similar note, why do you think that we separate our current selves from our younger selves so much? E.g. using third person to refer to yourself when you were younger. I feel like it's so weird to create this disconnect in our identity. I wasn't someone else who made those decisions when I was younger, it was me. I find the separation in language that other people use does influence how I think about myself. It detaches me from my memories and involvement in past events, but I remember my thought process and why I made those decisions I did. And it feels really weird that we like to divorce ourselves from our younger selves. It also creates this weird sense of time for me, as if we were characters in a book and not growing people, still connected to all the facets of our past. I love this question. And it's not really a question, I guess. I guess it's a statement I agree with, (laughs) which is why I love it. And it kind of links to what I'm about to say, which, which is I think that it kind of speaks to a tendency to think that we are our own opinions and like that we are our beliefs. I have um, been friends with people who have changed their beliefs over our friendship timeline and um, I love them the same and they seem the same to me. They are really kind of the same person. They might have understood the world more, they've been given more context and ways to show that they are kind people, but I do believe that most people are intrinsically kind. They're just misunderstanding how to be kind. They're like kind illiterate. (laughs) I totally agree and I think it's probably something that we need to heal from but I think it's also a response to a cultural climate that doesn't have a concept for forgiveness and doesn't have a or at times doesn't feel like it has a sense of time so people can have a tweet dug up from 10 years ago and people are expected to respond to it like it was tweeted yesterday which I find very weird. Uh, I, I often think the people who are most eager eager to cancel people are the people who uh, thought that way very recently and have just cleared up their evidence for it. It is a problem that we disconnect from our, our past selves and I think that is something to do with feeling embarrassed for ourselves. Um, even though we might believe that we were doing the best with the information that we had and the understanding that we had, I still think that it's very taboo to accept your past self because if you accept your past self, you have to ex- accept other people's past selves and effort, chore, sounds exhausting so yeah i think that veering away from that whole like third identity that like third person self is really important even if you have like had loads of growth it stops you from being able to connect to people who were like your past self i feel like a responsibility to talk to the people who misunderstand the world in the ways i used to and i don't think that responsibility should be on the people who they're having the misunderstandings about whether that comes to sexism or racism or homophobia or even just an emphasis if you were somebody who used to emphasize money a lot and emphasize wealth and the collection of wealth at any cost if you don't think that way now that could feel embarrassing and i i think the problem is like if we start equating who people are with their opinions then you can't isolate an ideology from a person 
And that's when you start to think I have to destroy, exclude or in an extreme way, kill somebody to get rid of this belief, to get rid of this opinion. And that has uh, just historically never worked out very well. <laughs> I used to be a Christian and I'm not anymore. There are some videos that exist on the channel about that if you'd like to find out. But one of the things I really miss about spending a lot of time around people who actually believed what they said and genuinely wanted to enact it, not all Christians, hashtag not all Christians, um, was the um, open idea that was just part of every conversation we had that was like, the aim is to forgive people, the aim is to not put anyone in the bin. <laughs> and that's something that I really miss from like progressive left-wing conversations that I was expecting to find and just didn't. Whereas some people that used to be my community that some people would think some of their beliefs are, are quite, quite right-wing um, had very, like much more left-wing beliefs when it came to um, rehabilitation, forgiveness, flexibility. Um, so that's been really interesting to think about. Thank you for your question. It, I obviously didn't answer it, but I, I guess I just agree. And it also just, it does fuck with your sense of time. It makes you feel like you're quite young and maybe that's where we get this whole like, oh, adulting, I'm still 14 in my head um, kind of rhetoric, which I obviously I feel a lot and have voiced on this channel before, but sometimes I call myself out on it because I'm like, you are 30. You have lived a long time. All of those people before you were also you and a part of your time allotment your like tube of experiences and i think maybe like renouncing our past selves can make us feel younger than we are or less experienced because at the end of the day i think if you're somebody who's changed their opinions vastly um over time you're way more useful to the movements that you're in because you know what it's like to lose all of your belief systems and have to rebuild them from scratch and that's something that doesn't make you younger actually I feel like it gives you more experience and the people I find hardest to talk to in left-wing circles are the people who have always felt the way they felt <laughs> and have never like had to pull the rug from under themselves I don't think that we should underestimate how important and useful uh, people's contributions who have changed their mind are to making the world a better place man so yeah should I have brought sun cream it's possible answers point to yes I'm actually in this really fancy part of Hampstead Heath that is kind of like a Victorian haunted garden. So I thought I'd show you around that as well while we speak. I really like this question and I have a lot of thoughts about it. How to use social media in a way that promotes yourself professionally and creatively, yet doesn't give too much of yourself away? <laughs> the million trillion dollar question uh, I'm not one for social media but I understand the importance in starting to build an audience for the art I create and to progress professionally in this day and age yet I feel in doing so I would have to manually create an online personality for myself which wouldn't, which wouldn't ever be accurate and the act of this seems weird and inauthentic to me how do you do it right <sighs> like obviously you're a different person around your friends and your family than you are to your colleagues um, and there is a big pressure on people I think to put out this universal self that applies to everyone that fits into every context that makes sense in every situation and that's a, an impossible task uh, one that you shouldn't set yourself that doesn't mean by any means that you shouldn't put out stuff on social media and obviously I do but I think it's a case of um, taking the pressure off a lot of like newspaper articles equate like inauthentic social media presences as pretending that you're more wealthy than you are pretending that you're happier than you are pretending that you are more qualified than you are but there's lots of grayish stuff in between that that is like not anybody else's business to measure people spend their whole lives trying to work out how to repre represent themselves in art or in the ethics that they follow or in the clothes that they wear and it's kind of this impossible but really fun task or it can be fun until it turns toxic and I think it turns toxic when you really think that it's achievable <laughs> it's like a fun game that you know you're never going to be able to win but the taking part is quite fun am I making any sense I'm not smoking anything I swear like for me it would be impossible for me to replicate what I am as a person in a series of videos that would be I'd either have to be an incredibly simple person or I'd have to be like a dog. And even I don't think we can represent dogs in videos. I think dogs have a very complicated uh, internal world. So I think it's more down to improving everybody's social media literacy, like people knowing that you're not putting your whole self out there and, and that that was never the aim. I used to, back in the early days of my channel, make stream of consciousness videos that I didn't really edit um, when I was feeling sad or if I was feeling like a very personal emotion. Um, 
and I don't regret that but now I I don't hide those parts of myself but I experience them in real time alone or with people that I know and then I usually use them to inform something much more curated and useful like I don't I don't think all of my thoughts my stream of conscious thoughts are going to be useful to you I don't want to put you through that I think we've all got limited amounts of time so I think it's okay to edit yourself uh, not only because authenticity is is kind of impossible but also so that you're only putting out what you really mean like parts of yourself that you genuinely think will help others and in a way that you think will help others just like you don't know your favorite musician because you've listened to all their albums it's the same with social media and it's okay to still make an album you know it's still it's still okay to to make a thing and people shouldn't expect it to be everything that you are it can just be a fun experiment a finger painting a rough draft of you and that's fine okay i'm not gonna lie i was really hoping to film something fancy in the stone space but i've counted four wedding shoots um two games of hide and seek and one very serious debate about drum and bass between about four boy teenagers <laughs> so i think it was a bit full which is fine i need to get up earlier i thought i'd sit by these jungle like ferns that honestly looks like a panther might jump out with me. I finished my master's degree in music composition this month. Congratulations. Um, and I'm hoping to start a PhD next year. A lot of people experience low motivation at this time, but I find myself affected by a specific event that I keep thinking back to. Earlier in the year, I don't remember exactly when, the Singapore Sunday Times published a survey of the public that got global attention. It said that artists are the least essential workers in society. Although there was a lot of backlash against the survey, I can't help feeling that continuing in my current career path will lead to me being considered unnecessary and irrelevant in society, especially because I am working in a field that the majority of the public either don't like or don't engage with, contemporary classical music. This thought was somewhat confirmed to me when the government announced their Covid Times art support, which I appreciate went some way to helping art venues open, but doesn't actually help the creatives who've lost work. I'm unsure whether the government doesn't understand how to help artists or want to be seen to be helping creative people without actually helping them, decreasing the surplus artistic population, as it were. <laughs> but perhaps that's just me being overly cynical. What do you think? Am I necessary and relevant? <sighs> dude this question hurt me and resonated with me in equal measure i really want to just like maybe write a video essay on all of this and like pull up loads of quotes and loads of evidence and i want to go like full hermione on it and give you stats on how much art changes the world but let me just try and pull something off the top of my head for now by the way uh for any of you thinking that this camera angle is a wes anderson artistic choice <laughs> It's more just so people don't think that I'm vlogging. I think this probably comes down to some wider questions about optimism and pessimism and how we measure like time. Making long-term choices about your happiness and your vocation based on the current government isn't doesn't add up, doesn't make mathematical sense. Um, your life is long. Governments are in power for four years max. I'm going to get some people who disagree with me in the comments here, but um, the world is getting better. Don't at me until I've had time to make the video essay on that. But like, I would like to refer you to this book if you can't be bothered to wait for me to make that video essay. But I think that having an optimistic, long-sighted view of how your passions will fit into the world is vital. And I also think that uh, for me, my own self-esteem and my own self like how I see myself um, would be lower if I just dropped my um, artistic practices um, because of who around me valued it. However, there is a pragmatic side to that. How do you make money? How do you survive? How do you thrive? How do you make sure that you are feeding the people around you? But I think, um, I don't know about you, but like for me, and I think for a lot of people who are arty, which is a self-deprecating way of saying artist, <laughs> I'm just a bit arty, I'm just a bit quirky. I am more effective, I'm kinder, I'm more centred, I make better decisions about who I vote for and where I put my money and where I work if I have given myself permission to make the artistic thing. To play the song, to write the poem, to wiggle the butt, whatever, however you do it, you will probably be effective in every other part of your life if you don't deny that part of yourself and you don't give up pursuing that. In the words of AOC, what we are not doing is giving up.
in times of like crisis like we're in now although we kind of seem to be constantly in crisis but that's just because some people are hoarding the money <laughs> i'm just gonna put loads of different books that i'm referencing up in the sky <laughs> Um, so that if you're bored you can work out more about it. It's understandable that people who look after physical bodies and logistics um, are honoured higher but also are they even honoured higher because they don't even pay NHS staff properly. Um, so I think if it's if it's to do with mon monetary worth I think that there are lots of industries that aren't valued properly and uh, the arts is one of the, the many ones so I think that the government has also turned its back on the more practical valuable side of of the workforce as well um so i don't think you need to feel bad about your your practice being unpragmatic if you're thinking about being supported financially because uh <laughs> there's no guarantee of that anyway our answers a different question to a lot of other professions a lot of other professions answer the question how how do we live how do we move through the world so whether that's like somebody who works in insurance to insure your life oh that's how you protect yourself against physical scary things somebody who's an architect that's how you build a house and then live in it an estate agent how you find a house to live in a lawyer how do you protect your physical assets or a chef how do you keep living oh you eat here's some food <laughs> these are very precarious anyway they all answer the question how do human bodies keep living and in what state art tries to answer the question or comfort people who are asking the question why why live why cat why why do this weird thing that we have found ourselves automatically doing we have the instinct to breathe we have the muscle memory to blink but we're the only species that goes but why and i don't know if you've noticed but they're both equally important questions <laughs> i can understand why some of those more pragmatic options um do make more sense to people in their heads but you also you can call on anybody at any kind of party and ask them um in your darkest moment in when everything physical fell through for you how did you keep going and they will name an artist they will name a writer or a poet or a musician or a piece of work somehow and they will be able to map that onto their lives as a moment when they were like I had the how, but I didn't have the why. And I think like stuff like contemporary classical music is something that is intangible and is like quite not explicit. It's not like a poem that's like, why you should keep living. A poem by Lena Norms. Uh, and that's why it can be sometimes more effective for people because it's so transient. It's so, um, you can't like touch it or really explain it. And it's often stuff that is expressed where words fail and it's the nuance of music that I think is what makes it powerful. I was also um, being served Ariana Grande uh, interviews on YouTube recently and when I say being served I mean actively searching for. Obviously Ariana Grande who's somebody who is a very well funded artist. Um, she can probably just go to her Instagram inbox and see how much she's valued. People scream at her when she starts singing her art. I would imagine that the evidence that her art means something to people isn't few and far between. However, the interviewer was asking her if like, if it was weird when people cried and screamed and um, stuff when they met her. And she said, well, yeah, some people do do that, but I completely understand. And I'm somebody who does that too. And she told this story about how Imogen Heap, who's one of my favourite artists, invited her to her house for dinner when she came to London and Ariana Grande genuinely thought it was a joke because she looks up to Imogen Heap so much and she says that she's influenced all, all the work that she's done in her whole career that she didn't feel worthy to be invited round to her house for some dinner. She thought it was a prank up until the top point when she got to the front door and then apparently when she met her she just cried and then didn't really say anything the whole evening when she was around Imogen's because she was just like what the fuck? And that was really interesting to me because one of the last gigs I went to was an Imogen Heap gig in London in the Roundhouse and there was fucking no one there. And I, she's one of my favourite artists ever. And me and my friend Sara went and it was such a wonderful night. But I was just looking at all the empty space. Obviously this was before COVID, all the empty space. And being like, where is everyone? Like I'm not somebody who likes to like niche people. I, I would love more people to understand how great Imogen Heap is. But it also reminded me of one of my other favourite bands that I've loved since I was about like 15 called Nisloppy, um, who took a very young teenage boy uh, as in, in as an intern and let and taught him everything they knew, quote, 
um, and that teenage boy was was Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran always like talks about how they have taught him everything and how they made him who he is. Uh, and obviously, everybody appreciates Ed Sheeran, but nobody really seems to appreciate Ms. Loppy in the same way that I do. <laughs> the point is, you putting your work out there um, is a butterfly effect kind of affair. You might not see what value it gains and um, what dominoes it pushes forward by doing it and it might not be the most popular genre um, but there are lots of side genres like what Imogen Heap does, like what Ms Loppy do, like what Seth Lakeman does. More experimental work that may not influence the masses, whatever that means, we could have packed that in a whole thing as well, influence a large amount of people who, are more, have, who have more mainstream tastes but it might influence the person who makes them more, who can translate for a more mainstream market and still move people. And that doesn't, and that's why I don't really like, I get really uncomfortable with like individual praise and genius and like holding artists up like they have invented things because it's often like a collective effort for every artist that gets famous. There's like 10 worse paid, precarious income, cyclical career, not like always going up kind of artists uh, that are behind that artist who either like directly taught them or inspired them. And it's the same, I do feel like that about my job. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I make videos on the internet with all of my imposter syndrome and all of my things that's like, oh, what is this? Does it even make any sense? What is it? Does it even make a difference? Is it even, is it just really vacuous and stupid? But I know that I have like an ev evidence in my inbox to say that it does help people. And I know from experience that the, sometimes even the most frivolous, vapid things can mean a lot to some people. And I'm assuming, um, person that sent me this request, question, that your work is not vapid and is not without meaning. Um, and just because we are currently under a government that doesn't get that, I feel like completely stopping making the art would, would mean that they won and we can't have that can we there is a really useful book called big magic that's all about the balance between vocation and job and like how it's okay for those to be completely different things so i understand like on a logistical level why at the moment it might not be great to set yourself up to be a full-time classical music artist just by looking at the facts and what's around but i don't think that means that you should just like switch gear into reverse and back out of um a really beautiful industry and a really beautiful um, way that humans communicate and make sense of the world because uh, from what I've seen on the IPPC report, IPCC, ICP, you know what I mean. The acronym isn't the key bit, is it? Um, we're going to need people to remind us why we're here and to give us intangible answers that don't have words and calm us and inspire us and um, accompany us in this absolutely stark raving bonkers time so i i deem you an essential worker <laughs> did you need a permission slip here it is i just saw the man with the biggest parrot on his shoulder it's literally the size of a dog Fuck. i feel like filming outside is like becoming a wild hunter <laughs> You have to be aware of all the footsteps around you. RGB makes me feel like I should be out there fighting the good fight for my community, but a lot more of me wants to move into the woods and live by myself and never look at the news ever again. This isn't a question, I suppose, just a conundrum. Whenever stuff has been hard for me in my life, I think about buying a one bed by the sea in Aberystwyth and pretending it's all not there. And then I think if it's climate change I'm running from, seaside towns aren't it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of like a um, a knee-jerk reaction to think I'm actually just going to go and make things simple and live in a tent again. <laughs> and it's a valid fantasy to indulge in. And I think actually sometimes practically it's quite, it can be quite good for some people. Can I recommend the YouTube channel Mossy Bottom? It's literally a man converting an old shepherd's hut and learning to live off the land with his dog. And it is the most wholesome thing and not something that I would rule out in the future. However, I'm well aware that it wouldn't solve everything. And if you can find a wood that's floating in the universe and has its own sun and moon <laughs> and atmosphere, drop me the postcode, I will 100% meet you there. However, I think there is something to be said in this metaphor, activism and getting stuck in and doing everything you can to change things and just wanting to hide. irony of me hiding from people who are coming. For those of you who think I'm a confident person, I thought I was too until I tried to vlog in public. I think mentally opting out of some stuff has really kept me sane. <laughs> so I think a lot of people live with a more secure idea of the future 
and letting go of the pressure to feel that has been really good for me and I think that's my version of going into the woods like metaphorically when it comes to picturing the future um, so I think like mentally building yourself a hut in the woods to retreat into uh, where you agree on what reality is and you keep your beliefs and worries and like simple truths in there that would be great but I also agree we're gonna need some more notorious RGBs in this world and uh, she doesn't strike me as somebody who let other people immerse her into their worlds or took home existential worry <laughs> and she still achieved a lot so I think as well like we've got this idea of activists who are people who are always on always throwing themselves into their work never have any hobbies never delight in the small things or retreat into huts and I would just wager that it's probably not the case. So it can be intimidating to look at people who have changed so much in the course of a lifetime. But I imagine when you're in that lifetime and you're like not looking over it from a bird's eye view and you're actually living it, it doesn't really feel like much is changing and it doesn't really feel like you're extraordinary or you're doing that much. Thank you so much for watching this very strange video. This video is free to watch, but it's free to watch because a very small percentage of lovely people tip me per video to make them happen. It's as little as a dollar per thing. I post four to five things per month, but you can cap it. So if you only wanna pay me $1 for one thing a month, then that's totally fine and you will still be an equal member of the Gumption Club. We have a secret Facebook group. We're always having existential crises, like always, every day, there is somebody with an existential crisis post and then we all like brainstorm it, it's really fun. We have Wholesome Film Club where we watch films together and chat. Um, so if you wanna meet like-minded, shrewd and spirited people, um, then I'll leave the link below to that. A lot of you asked me about eco-anxiety and I am making a whole video on that so I'm going to leave it for now uh, but I just really want to drop this book recommendation in your heart if you're just feeling like maybe humanity should probably be put in the bin. Thank you so much for watching, uh, Frog Snug out. <laughs>